I do want to say before we get start, started, 10 years ago today, I believe is the day that God gave me a vision of the women, speaking to women. And they, they, I had these women's faces coming in front of me, different women, uh, different nationalities. They were in their costume. They're in their native costume, American, Jewish, African, I remember, you know, all that Asian. And they all were coming to me and all had smiles on their faces. And I kept saying, I can't talk to you right now. I got to see Jesus. I've got to see Jesus. And at the same time that that was happening, I was um, having contractions. I felt like I was having another baby. And I came here, this was December 13th, 2008. I came here and I told Dola about it and he goes, you were birthed in your ministry. It took 10 years. But are we ready to begin? All right. Let's begin with prayer. My heavenly Father, I thank you. My heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you sent us Jesus. Father, open our eyes that we can see. Open our ears like we can hear, that we can hear. Open our hearts like you did for Lydia, that we can attend unto the things which are spoken. Turn us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto you. And Father, let thy power be great and grant us these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will turn with me, we're going to switch it up a little bit. First Peter 3, I'm going to begin there. And we're talking to women. These meetings are for women. But we take these meetings and we put them on radio for everyone. And these meetings also go on shortwave all over the world. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word, see, you don't always have to preach, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation, your behavior coupled with fear. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of the hair or wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. You notice right there, it is not what some have said, well, you can't wear anything fancy. It says, or putting on of apparel. You got to wear clothes. It's required by law. So that does not mean that you can't wear nice clothes. It's saying, don't let that be your adorning. It said, but let the hidden man, but let that adorning be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit which in the sight of God in the sight of God is of great price and if we read this on it goes for after this manner in the old time the holy women also did you know they were holy who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters are you as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. How are you going to do that? You're going to walk in the gospel. Well, I don't have a husband. You've got Jesus as your husband then. You walk in the gospel. And you know what? You can walk in that gospel and things look like your husband's going to go off the deep end. And you can believe God and not be afraid. You know, sometimes I noticed when I, um, I noticed that some of my outbursts were because of fear. Because of fear. You know what? If you're not afraid, you don't say dumb things. Now, turn with me to John 10, verse 35. Our verse, John 10, 35. I'm going to begin in verse 34. Jesus is speaking. He said, Jesus answered the Jews. He said, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. He said, if he called them gods, and that's he's talking out of the law. And then notice he said, unto whom the word of God came. So the word of God came to these. So we're speaking the word of God. The word of God and the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be broken. Who is talking here? The word. The word's talking. And he's saying that the word cannot be broken. Now, if we believe that, 
When we believe that, when we believe that, and when we put our trust in it, that's when it manifests. That's when it works. Otherwise, it's just words on a page. It's when we mix our faith with the Word of God. When we trust in it, and that's what basically faith is. It's a trust. When we trust in what that Word of God says, that's when it comes to pass. That's when the things change, is when your faith works. Now, with that, that the Word of God cannot be broken, I want you to turn to John 3. The Word of God cannot be broken. If you believe it. If you believe it. Now, look what the Word of God says. Tuck this in your little heart, because you're going to need it. Verse 16. For God. So loved the world. The word of God can't be broken. And you say, maybe God doesn't love me. The word of God cannot be broken. And the word of God said, for God so loved the world. Do you see that? The next time your heart says, God doesn't love me, you say, it is written. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me. Because I'm in the world. I am not on Mars. I am in the world. For God so loved you. For God so loved you. And the word of God cannot be broken. When you listen to anything else other than that word of God, you are listening to a lie. Now that lie may be the devil and it may be your own heart. But you know what? You don't have to listen to what your heart says. Your heart is deceitful. Really deceitful. Our whole fight sometimes doesn't have to do with the devil. It has to do with our own heart. You can talk to your heart. It is written. It is written. God so loved the world. And look what he says as he goes on. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God, not just Jesus, for God sent not his own son into the world to condemn you. God did not send Jesus in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. It is written, and the word of God cannot be broken. God did not send Jesus to condemn you. He sent him to save you. That's why you don't run away from him. That's why you don't go hide in the corner because you think God doesn't like you. It is written. And the word of God cannot be broken. It is written. He didn't send Jesus to condemn you. He sent Jesus to save you. And I want to make a distinction here. It says that God so loved the world. Do you know that God doesn't have love? God is love. Big difference. God doesn't have love for you. God is love. He is love. You think that good looking man loves you. You think those children love you, that they have love for you. God is love. He is love. He can't do anything but love you. If you will believe. But if you listen to the lies, he can't help you. That's the fight, not listening to the lies. It says in Lamentations, if you believe a lie, you forsake your own mercy. God never leaves you, never. Jesus never forsakes you. He will never leave you. The only person that leaves is us. 
The only person that will leave God is you. He will not leave you. Jesus will not forsake you. He is always with you. The only person that walks off is you. You know what? When you find yourself in trouble, you run to him. You run to him. Jesus came to save you. He didn't come to condemn you. Boy, that was good. Now, come with, uh, go with me to Romans. Well, we're going to go to Romans 7. I've got it here. We're going to read some scriptures in Romans 7, but I want to read it in the English Standard Version because it's a lot easier to understand. When I was young, I used to think this was a riddle. And then I got old and realized it was something I didn't want to read because it was so true. And I'm going to read it to us, and we're going to start here. We're going to... We're going to read this first, and I'll go from here. Romans 7, verse 15. You can follow along in the King James, but I'm going to read it in the English Standard. For I do not understand my own actions. This is going to be fun. For I do not, I do, not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Can any of us relate? Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, the Ten Commandments, the law, that it's good. So now it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin that dwelleth in me. That explains why you don't do the things you want to do. And you do the things you don't want to do. It's for 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So now you know right here, where does that sin dwell? It dwells in your flesh. It dwells in your flesh. And you say, well, what is your flesh? Your arms, your legs, your ears, your eyes, Everything on the outside and your soul, that's your flesh. That's your flesh. It says, for I, um, I do, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right. Oh, we wake up with that every morning. But not the ability to carry it out. Isn't that the truth? For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. We're going to answer some of your questions today. But it is sin that dwelleth in me. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, in my face. It says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members. Your mouth is a member. Your ears are a member. Your stomach is a member. Your arms, your legs, all those things are members. It says, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Have you ever felt this way? That's why Paul wrote it. Did he write it to condemn us? We know by the word of God, no, he didn't. What's he doing? He's bringing it to the surface so he can deal with it. And that's what we're doing with today. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with the flesh, I got all sorts of problems. Now, with that, we all can relate to that. What are we going to do? Turn with me to Romans 5. I'm going to begin in verse 12. And there's a, a phrase that I'm after. And I want to show you today what God opened up to me this week that I have never seen before in this capacity. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. 
by one man, sin entered in to the world. Do you know when the world started, sin wasn't here? Have you ever thought about that? When God created the world, sin was not here. God didn't put it here. It wasn't here. How did it get here? How did it get here? Let's keep reading. Wherefore by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Who was the first one that sinned? It says Adam. I think if you go down a little bit more. Yeah, it says 14. For nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses. It was Adam that brought the sin in. Notice God did not did not lay that sin on Eve. She was the first one to eat. God laid that on Adam. Why? It says Eve was deceived. That little, lovely little serpent said, come here. You won't die if you eat that fruit. He said, that fruit will make you know good and evil. Do you realize that Adam and Eve had no consciousness of evil. None. No evil thoughts. None. They had no consciousness of sin. No consciousness of evil. There wasn't any. It wasn't here. It was a perfect world. They called it paradise. They walked in innocence. They walked without sin. And then Satan in the serpent came in and convinced Eve to eat the fruit. She was deceived. But Adam, if you read, was right there with her and he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. And God laid that sin on Adam. And when Adam sinned, that's when sin came in. He wasn't here before. It was innocence. Sin came in and the devil brought it. And if we look at that verse again, it says, For wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. What came along with the sin? Death. The wages of sin are death. There was no death here until Adam sinned. No death. It came in with the sin and the devil brought it. That's where sin came in. And you know what it says here? It says, it is written, And so death passed upon all men, for in that all have sinned. When that sin came in, that was the sinful nature, too. Not just the sin, it was the nature. It was the sinful nature. It's what makes us sin. If we didn't have that sinful nature, we wouldn't sin. Because there would be nothing that would make us sin. So now we have a sinful nature. And now that sinful nature brings about death. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Turn with me to Romans 8. I'm going to begin in verse 3. For God so loved you that he sent Jesus not to condemn you, but to save you. And you know what? God knew there was a sinful nature. God knows that we naturally sin. Naturally. It's not real hard to sin, folks, is it? All right? That's that nature. And it says, for the law, could, what the law could not do, thou shalt not, could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Weak through the flesh. Why? Because sin, that nature, that element that came in with Adam is in our flesh. It's in every one of us. It came through Adam. Every one of us has that sinful nature. Every one of us has that in our flesh, that sin. It says that it was weak through the flesh. That's why we can't seem to obey anything. Because of the sinful nature in us. We can't obey the law. Why? It's the sinful nature in us. We just read that in, in Romans 7. I do what I don't want to do. And what I want to do, I can't. That's the sinful nature in the flesh. Now what are we going to do with it? In that it was weak through the flesh. God, knowing that, 
sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had it too. He had it too. Jesus had it too. He had to have it too. Why? So he could deal with it. Jesus had that sinful flesh. He had that flesh. He had that nature to sin. He just never sinned. But he was tempted in every point. And if you don't have that sinful nature in you, you're not going to be tempted. If you don't have that, that nature in you, you are not going to be tempted. Like I said before, you can't tempt me with fried frog legs. There is nothing in me that cares about fried frog legs. So you can't tempt me with it. But we have a sinful nature. And it lusts after everything. Why? Because it's the sinful nature that Adam brought in. That's what tempts us. Jesus had to have that same nature in his flesh. He had to have it. Why? So he could deal with it. Let's read on. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin to. He had the sinful nature and he came for sin condemned sin in the flesh. You know what that word condemned means? He judged it. That very nature that Adam brought in, that very nature that made all of us the same, that made all of us have that sinful nature, that sin in our flesh that we can't seem to do right, Jesus had it too, and he came, and he was born into a woman, with a, from a woman, Jesus was born of a virgin, and when he was born of the virgin, he got our sinful nature. God made sure he got our sinful nature. Why? So he could fix it. So he could get rid of it. So he could get rid of the very sinful nature out of us. So that we don't even have the nature to sin. And Jesus, the only way he could do that, was to die. The only way Jesus dealt with the sinful nature was to die. Jesus never sinned. He never sinned. It says that. He that is without sin became sin. He became sin. He took on all our sin. He had to have our nature. He had to walk like we did. He had to walk like Adam did after Adam screwed up so he could fix what Adam messed up. Jesus had to walk like Adam so he could fix what Adam messed up. And the way he did that was he was on the cross and he took all our sin and he had the sinful nature and he died. He died with the sin on him. He died with the sin in him. Your sin. Your sin he died with. Not somebody else's sin. And not all sin. He died with your sin. Make sure you get that. Some people say, yes, he died with all sin. No, he died for your sin. Paul, Peter says that. He died for your sin. So your sin was on that body. And not only was your sin on that body, but your sinful nature was on that body. And he died. And you know the wonderful thing about dead people? They don't sin. They don't sin. Terry Mai died in 2009. Terry Mai is not dead. Terry Mai is sleeping. In Jesus. Terry Mai isn't sinning. Terry Mai is not sinning. He hasn't sinned since he died, at least. Terry Mai is not sinning. He's dead. He's dead. Do you know that Jesus died to that sinful nature? The sin, the sin, it, he left it in hell. God forgave him. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he didn't have the sinful nature. He didn't have the sinful nature when God raised him from the dead. 
When God raised him from the dead, all that sin was forgiven. And not only was the sin forgiven, but the sinful nature that Adam brought in, Jesus condemned, judged it, made it of none effect. None effect. Jesus raised from the dead was a man without sin. A man that had no corruption. None. The nature was gone. The nature was dealt with. Now, where does that leave us? God is so smart. He is so wise. He is so loving. He is so kind. Turn with me to Romans 6. This is how God dealt with the sinful nature in us. I'm going to begin in verse 1, Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It says, Know you not that so many of us were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Do you know what baptized is? There are some that might, listening to this may not know what baptized is. Baptized. Baptized here means a covering over. And this is when you are baptized in water, totally immersed, not sprinkled, not sprayed, totally immersed, baptized, covered with water. Why? Why do we cover the Christians with water? Why is it so important that the Christian must be covered in water? But I'll tell you this, you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. All you have to do is be born again. And so if you're born again at the last second of your breath, you're going to heaven. But if you're still here on earth, who wants to live with the sinful nature? God didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. And he came for you to walk just like Jesus did. And this is how we get there. All right? It says, therefore, for being buried, buried, not sprinkled, buried, Buried with him by baptism into death. Into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of Jesus' death. If you look up that word planted, it means united. Did you know when we are baptized in water, we are united with Jesus in his death. We die with Jesus. When we are put under that water, we are buried, we die. That sinful nature dies. It dies with Jesus. That nature that, we, that makes us do things that we don't want to do dies united with Jesus' death. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When you are put in the water, you die. You die. For a moment, you are dead. And you are dead with Jesus. United with him in his death death Jesus had to die and when we're baptized in water we join him in death and we die you say but our heart keeps beating our flesh dies for a moment we're dead in Jesus and that sinful nature is condemned it is put to death it dies. It dies. Now, it says six, knowing this. Oh, let's go back to verse five. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, our old man, that's the flesh. That's what wants to go over here and do things it's not supposed to. The old man is crucified with him, you died with him. You were crucified that the body of sin, that sinful nature, might 
be destroyed. And that might isn't in there. Be destroyed. It's destroyed. That nature, when you go in the water, is destroyed. Destroyed. And when you come out, well, let's go on. It says, that might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that's dead, and you were dead in the water, he that's dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So you not only are buried, you are raised again with Jesus. It says, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But he that liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon. That word reckon means to accept as certain. Certainly. You also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That sinful nature was judged. It was condemned. It was destroyed. If you believe. If you believe. You have to mix faith with it. Like I've said before, when I was in the sign business, we had a wonderful glue that we used on acrylic. And that glue, once you put it on, boy, it did not come off for anything. I mean, it went through tornadoes and everything else was destroyed, but that glue was still there. That glue, that strong glue only works. You get it in a can and you get a little thing with it, a little container with the activator. And the only way that glue works is you have to add the activator. While in our Christian walk, the only way that the Word of God works is you have to have the activator. And the activator is your faith. Your faith. You have to trust it. You have to believe it. You have to believe what the Word says and not believe what everybody else, including you, are saying. It's the Word of God. And you use your faith. And I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, uh, Smith Wigglesworth had a wonderful, a wonderful way of testifying about this. He had a man come to him. And he told Smith, he said, and he was a, he was a pastor. And he said, Smith, I've got a problem. He said, I have uh, an affection for somebody I shouldn't have an affection for. And you know what Smith told him? He asked him a question. He said, is that your old man or your new? Do you know that he didn't have to cast the devil out of him? What did the man have to do? He had to believe that that part of him died. A lot of times we think that we need a devil cast out of us when it's really our old man is alive and kicking. So how do we get rid of the old man that's alive and kicking? How do we get rid of him? Let's go quickly to Romans 8. How can we put that old man back in the grave? And sometimes when you're first walking in this, you got to put him back in the grave every five minutes. But that's all right. That's walking in faith. That's believing. That's believing that that nature in you died. All right, we're going to go to, let's see. Uh, let's go to verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We walk in the spirit. We walk in faith. We walk believing the gospel. If you go back to Romans 6, verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. When that old man comes up, you pray. You pray, you talk, you put that old man off in the spirit by prayer, by believing, by talking to it. You walk out that with your faith, you get that old man back in the grave. And you know what? It's a war. Because you'll find when you first start, the old man's up here and your spirit's down here. And then there's a war and oh, it's awful. But then there's a day when it starts to go the other way. 
And it doesn't take so long to get your spirit above. You know, when I know I'm walking in the spirit, my old man isn't talking. Not at all. Not at all. None of those lusts are, 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 are bothering me. None of them. Why? Because I'm in the spirit. I'm not in the old nature. And that's where God made us to be. He made us to walk in the spirit, just like Jesus did. Jesus had that nature. But you know what? Jesus had to be baptized in water too. He had to be. Why? He had to put the old man to death just like we did. He was the first one to do it. And he, he's our example. He had to put the old man to death too. And that's how he could walk. And he, all those temptations, he never sinned. Why? Because he had faith. Because he believed. Because he walked in it. Not because he was God. Because he wasn't. He was us. But he walked in faith and that's what we need to do and you cannot get here until you were born again you can't even begin to get rid of that nature you can't even begin to it until you are born again you can try for your whole life thou shalt not do this i'll never do this again i'll never do this again i'll never do this again have you ever done that and five minutes later you're doing it you cannot even start to overcome until you are born again. Jesus said in that John 3, you must be born again. And what does it mean to be born again? It means you ask Jesus to come into your heart. That he, Jesus, comes into your heart. And that he leads you. He becomes your Lord. And he is a shepherd. And that's the wonderful thing. When you are born again, he's your shepherd. And he will lead you into all of this. He'll lead you by day. He'll lead you by night. He will lead you into all this. And he'll talk to you. And he'll show you what you need to do. That's the wonderful thing. He does not leave you without somebody to lead you. He leads you. Amen? Amen. I could have used a whole hour on this. Boy, is this nice. We're not putting to death the flesh enough. I heard somebody the other day, I'm trying to get rid of my unbelief. You don't try. You do. And you put it to death. Uh, uh, R.W. Shambach had a, a guy come up to him and he said, I need, uh, he said, I need you to cast the devil out of me. And Shambach said, I know devils. He said, he didn't have one. And he said, why? And he said, because I lie all the time. And R.W. Shambach said, that's not a devil. That's you. He said, that's your old man. Put it to death. Kill him. Put him back in the grave. You have been risen from the dead. You have been risen from the dead with Jesus. You don't have to yield to it anymore. You have overcome in baptism. You can put it down. Before baptism, it, it's, you can't. That's why Jesus brought baptism, to destroy it but you got to use your faith. Amen? Everybody doing all right? I think we're going to go have some funerals today. Hey, that answered a question I had. I mean, I, I was, th there's something, in, in something simple. I just couldn't seem to overcome. Simple. And it's like, and then I was reading the other day, and God said, by, uh, sin came in sin came in through Adam's sin and I'm like the light went on I mean God just it just I love how God does it he takes one verse and then he just opens it all up and I saw the revel I mean I got more revelation than I ever have of we have that sinful nature the nature has been destroyed so go home and have a funeral amen thank you